All right, so next, please welcome Emily Jens from Google Federated Learning and Analytics team to talk about federated learning. I'm very excited to have Emily here because um, she has been giving a lot of talks over the years at, at our GDG Seattle event. So it's great to see you here, Emily, at our DevFest um, West Coast 2020. Awesome, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining me today. Um, I'll be talking about federated learning. Um, I'd also like to quickly plug an event we're having this Friday. Um, it's It will be a tutorial over TensorFlow Federated or TFF. I'll get, be getting more into TensorFlow Federated um, later in this talk, but if you go ahead and go to that link, which I believe Margaret will also be posting in the live stream comments, um, you can register for the event and you'll get more details that way. Awesome, so let's jump into it. The goal of federated learning is to enable edge devices to do state-of-the-art machine learning without centralizing any of the user data and with privacy by default. So let's provide some intuition behind why federated learning is so exciting. Hospitals contain tons of patient records and these are highly sensitive. Hospitals don't really want to centralize this information due to privacy concerns. So we can imagine this being a scenario where federated learning could be used to enable hospitals to keep this information decentralized and private, but it still allow for hospitals to learn from this information in aggregate through things like federated analytics and federated learning. So today I'll be talking about why decentralized data is exciting how we can make use of this data in a secure and private way through federated computations, specifically federated learning, and how to experiment with these concepts using TensorFlow Federated or TFF. So why is decentralized data interesting? Well, for one thing, decentralized data is everywhere. There are billions of phones and Internet of Things devices that are constantly generating data. Smartphones themselves, if you kind of think about it, are the world's largest supercomputer. So it's interesting to think of them as decentralized compute nodes. The decentralized data stored on these devices could enable better products and smarter models. So can we harness the power of these edge devices without centralizing the data or without collecting this data? And why would we want to centralize this data or why would we want to um, bring learning to the edge? Well, we have many of these benefits. So you see an increase in user experience through things like lower latency to prediction, the ability to use the models when the phone itself is offline. Bringing learning to the edge is better for privacy concerns as well because the learning is localized to the device itself. Um, this is also better for things like resource limitations like battery life and data caps since the phone isn't transmitting tons of uh, training data or inference requests to the centralized server. Because we're only performing on-device training when it comes when the device is plugged in and idle, we try to minimize the battery usage and performance impact on the device itself. So, wow, bringing learning to the edge has tons of benefits. Why don't we just bring all of the learning to the device? It's tempting to bring just the whole machine learning pro process to the device itself and cut out the centralized server. But that approach itself has limitations. If we don't have a server in the loop, how do we answer analytics questions about that decentralized data? How would we continue to improve the models based on data um, that other edge devices have? And how do you seed phones themselves with models that are already smart so it doesn't take lots and lots of training on that device? Um, so that's what we'll really be looking at in the context of federated learning. So can we do cross-device machine learning and analytics without centralized data collection? Um, it turns out we can, and that's through federated learning. Next, I'm going to walk through the basic process of how federated learning works. So let's jump into let's jump into a brief example of like this is a pretty simple example of how FL works. So the initial model, as dictated by the model engineer, will be sent to the phone. 
Um, I don't know if I have a pointer. So that's this guy. Oh, I guess it doesn't show up. <laughs> um, for the initial model, usually zeros or a random initialization is sufficient for it. Or if you have some relevant proxy data in the cloud, you could also start from a pre-trained model in this case. Next, the device that received that initial model will compute an update to that model using its own local training data. And only this update then is sent back to the server to be aggregated. None of the raw training data that was used to produce the update leaves the device. Other devices will participate in this round of training as well, performing their own local rounds of learning, each computing an update using its own local training data. Some clients may drop out before uploading their update to the server, but that's OK. Our federated learning protocol is resilient to this. So the server will then aggregate users' updates into a new model by averaging the updates together, or this is where the federated averaging comes from. The updates will then be discarded after use. The engineer will be monitoring the performance of the federated learning process through metrics that are themselves aggregated along with the model. And it's important to keep in mind that this process is iterative. New devices can check in with a server and participate in another round of training using the updated model parameters from the last round of training. To produce, and then this produces another updated model that has learned from the new client's aggregated data. Cool, so we've shown that federated learning works um, in production here at Google to improve the model intel intelligence without the need for having centralized training data or performing centralized learning. One example that I'd really like to highlight is how we've used federated learning at Google to improve our mobile keyboard. People don't really think much about their keyboard, but they spend hours on it each day. And in general, like typing is 40% slower on a mobile keyboard than it is on a physical one. So this kind of shows how important federated learning is um, to improve this model intelligence behind the keyboard. Models here are essential for tap typing, gesture typing, auto corrections, predictions, text to voice, and more, which all greatly benefit from federated learning. So what I've shown you here are the basic concepts of how federated learning works. In practice, the process is much more complicated. Federated learning is still an active area of research. There are many extensions here, like differential privacy, compression, quantization, secure aggregation, et cetera. Um, you can think of things like federated distillation or federated BERT or things like that, which are really exciting and on the frontier of research. Um, I just briefly walked you through a very simple round of federated training, but there are many other federated computations available as well, like federated evaluation, federated analytics, et cetera, that provide insights and make use of your own decentralized data. So now that we're all stoked on uh, what federated learning is, how can you yourselves experiment with federated learning? Um, we've provided a community project for all to develop the building blocks of federated computations with TensorFlow Federated or TFF. Um, here's the link if you'd like to explore some tutorials about it. Um, it currently allows you to experiment with federated learning and other federated computations in simulation only with more planned in the future, so stay tuned. So inspired by all of our experiences building our own production federated learning system here at Google, we've created TensorFlow Federated, um, but it's been generalized to be able to express any federated computation. TFF is an open source framework for federated learning and federated computations on decentralized data. So jump in and have an influence where the system goes. Because this is a relatively new project, it's rapidly evolving. Um, and we're encouraged, um, we encourage you to make contributions to it and impact the future of federated systems. So here's that GitHub link if you're interested in the code itself or if you want to contribute to it. Um, there's many ways to get involved. So we've made TFF an open system. And this system is designed for composability to make it easy to express the kinds of computations that will enable better research, et cetera. 
We really, we hope it will allow researchers to better understand what works and what doesn't work in a federated system. And it will help federated enthusiasts develop um, faster together and it will create an ecosystem for new applications or deployment environments. So speaking of deployment, TFF compiles all code into an abstract representation, meaning that it's architecture agnostic. Currently, this is only available to be run in simulation, but someday we'd like for it to be able to be deployed to real devices. So you can think of a world where we can take that same representation and actually deploy it in production. So stay tuned for that. Cool. So here again is that tutorial link. So TFF is about having fun, experimenting, and building your own federated computations. We've divide, designed it in such a way that you don't have to worry about the major pain points um, that we faced when developing our own federated learning system. And here's some of the pain points, like interleaving different types of logic, tension between the order of construction versus execution, and like global versus local um, perspectives and communication. So TFF offers two main APIs. We have the Federated Learning API, or FL API, and the Federated Core API. So the FL API is a higher level API. It provides implementations of federated training um, through federated averaging and evaluation that can be applied to your own existing Keras models for you to experiment with FL in simulation. This layer sits on top of the other layer, which is much more lower level and gives you a more generic expressions that allow you to design and simulate custom types of computations and really control your own orchestration. So this is called the Federated Core API, which allows you to build your own federated computations. Um, there's also local runtime simulations available. So again, there are many, many ways to get involved depending on what's uh, area of the stack interests you. This layered architecture is for a clean separation of concerns. So if you specialize in a different area, you can spend your time in the part that really interests you, whether that be the machine learning layer, compiler theory, et cetera. Awesome, so let's jump into the federated learning or FL API. Um, if you'd like more details on this, uh, here's that link. Um, I just encourage you to go into that tensorflow.org slash federated, and from there you can find all the other links that I'll be presenting on today. So in order to facilitate experimentation, we've seeded the TFF repository with a few um, federated data sets, including a federated version of the um, classic MNIST data set that contains a version of that original NIST data set but it's been reprocessed using LEAF so that the data itself is keyed by the original writer of the digits. Since this writer has, since each writer has their own unique style, this data set will exhibit that kind of non-IID um, behavior expected for a federated data set. So here's what the code looks like for um, TFF. We provide data sets that are pretty good proxies for those federated data sets again. And these can be um, accessed by um, returning, by using this load data function. Um, the load data function returns a data set, um, which is an instance of the tff.simulation.client data interface that allows you to enumerate a set of users to construct TF data sets that represent the data of a particular client. And this, this allows you to query the structure of individual elements because this is simulation. Um, here is where you will plug in your own Keras model. Um, so if you have a Keras model, you can wrap it like this so it's consumable by TFF. Almost all of the information that's required by TFF can be derived from Keras um, interfaces. Oh, that, that, that link got off. So let's actually take a look at what a Keras model looks like. So if you're familiar with Keras already, this probably looks pretty familiar to you. Um, here, we're just creating a simple model that will um, solve the MNIST um, example for us. We see we're creating a sequential model. It has one dense layer, and we'll be using a softmax to get our results. 
And here we're also attaching our loss, our optimizer, and our metrics. So now that we have a model, um, which we've wrapped as a tff.learning.model under the hood for use with TensorFlow Federated, we can let TFF construct a federated averaging algorithm by invoking this helper function here, tff.learning.build federated averaging process. So this is gonna go ahead and construct that federated training algorithm just using a provided Keras model. So all you have, you'd have to do on this end is provide a model, and now this will work in a federated environment on decentralized data. So let's invoke the initialize method of that um, iterative process we just built under the hood with that method. Um, this will get our initial server state. Um, then we can call train.next, which will run a round of federated training. So this includes sending the initial server state to each of the clients. Um, each of the clients will run their own local round of training and send their updates back to the server. Um, back on the server, we'll get that aggregated um, new global model that's been produced from the decentralized data of each of the clients. And finally, we can think of doing um, federated evaluation to understand the state of our trained model. Uh, so the tff.learning.build federated evaluation will provide a federated computation for evaluation for you. And again, you can just plug in your own model function again here. That's a Keras model that's been wrapped as a tff.learning model. And then you can run evaluation using this here, and you'll get back metrics that will show you how your training is progressing. Again, that was a little bit fast. That might have been kind of overwhelming. Full tutorials are available at this link here at tensorflow.com slash federated. Cool. So now let's jump into the federated core or FC API. This one is um, a lot lower level, so there's going to be a lot here. Um, I hope to just kind of cover some of the general um, components of this. But again, this will be a lot, so I encourage you to go to that tutorial page. So the FC API is a lower level API than the FL API. It's a language for constructing distributed systems. It introduces some abstract concepts, so let's go ahead and deep dive into those concepts that are introduced by TFF. So first I'm going to explain what a federated value is. Let's set up a scenario where we have a group of clients. In this case, each client is an individual smart temperature sensor. Each sensor is going to have its own local item of data. In this case, let's pretend it's the maximum temperature that that device saw in a single day. So you can see that, oh yeah, and this is in Celsius by the way. So we can see that each device has seen a different maximum temperature. Each local item of the client's data has a type of float32 because this is like a sensor reading. So we refer to all of these sensor readings collectively as a federated value or a multiset. Values like this are first class citizens, meaning that they have a type. So here's what a federated type is. A type includes both the where the value is located which we call the placement. So all of these values are located at the clients and the actual type of each of the local items of data. So this is float32. So what happens now when we throw in our server into the mix? So the server will also have a value and this value itself is a float32 at the server. This time we've dropped the curly embraces to indicate that it's one value and not many values. So from all these sensor readings, how do we get our value back on the server? So let's introduce the concept now of a distributed aggregation protocol that will connect the pieces of our federated system. Let's say that it will compute the mean of all the client values to get that aggregated value back on the server. So now we've aggregated our um, sensor readings together to get the mean. So in TFF, we can think of a fun, um, we can think of a federated operation 
as a function, even though its inputs and its outputs live in different places. So the input to this function was all the client values that lived at the client, and then it gets this up. Hello, sorry, did I cut out for a second? Anyways, <laughs> thanks for bearing with me. Um, we provide a library of federated operators that represent the common distributed aggregations that you would use. Uh, for example, the federated average, which averages the results from the clients back to the server. I'm going to now run through a brief code example using TFF. I'm not going to go too into depth, so it might look a little confusing. But at the end, I'll be putting a link, link up that will lead you to the tutorials where you can walk through the code yourself. So here, we'll be declaring a federated type that represents the input. And next, we'll be passing as an, this as an argument to um, this special function decorator that declares this a federated computation. We'll be invoking our federated operators here. So here we have that federated average intrinsic. So that was like a very simple example. So let's do a more interesting example. This time we'd like to compute what fraction of sensors have a reading over a certain threshold. So we have a threshold that we input at the server it will be broadcast to each of the clients. So here's our first federated operator that we've introduced. This broadcast will get the value from the server to the clients. We next have a map step. Um, you can think of this map step as the map step in MapReduce with tff.federatedMap, which will get all of our ones and zeros representing whether each client value was over the broadcasted thresholds. Then we'll perform another federated operator, which is um, the federated aggregation, which will get the results back on the server. So here again, we're using tff.federated average. So what does this look like in code? We'll again be declaring our inputs here. So here we're adding a threshold type. You can see it's a uh, float32 and it lives at the server. And in the body, again, we'll be invoking all of our federated operators. So here we're calling, you can see that we're calling that federated broadcast of the threshold that's getting it to all of the client devices. We're performing a federated map set to see if each of, individually on each of the clients, if their maximum value is over that threshold. And then we'll do, be doing a federated average to get that value back on the server. So here's the, and here we've highlighted the local computation that each device will be performing on its own temperature reading. So this is just the computation that each device will be executing locally. Cool, that was a whirlwind introduction to the Federated Core API. We welcome your contributions. What you've seen here today is open source again, and it's available on uh, GitHub. So there's those links. There's many ways to get involved. You can apply the FL API to existing ML models and data and see what happens. You can develop new federated algorithms and you can help evolve the API itself um, as a foundation for TFF. For another look at the ideas we've introduced today, you can also check out this cool comic book that we have available at federated.withgoogle.com. We are really fortunate to work with two incredibly talented comic book artists to illustrate these concepts of as graphic art. There's also corgis. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Emily, for the great talk. Uh, so we, I think I saw a question. 
earlier, it, do you have, uh, I think this is the question, do you have a sample project showing federated ML for mobile app using TFI? I think the keyboard example you show these on mobile, but is there actually a sample people can look at? Yeah, so um, here at Google, we actually have a federated learning system that works in production with um, the computations being deployed to actual devices and back. TFF currently only supports a simulation runtime. It hasn't been extended to a production environment yet. Um, that is all TBD. Again, we do welcome contributions if that interests you. Um, thanks for that question. And here's another question. Uh, does the federated system account for active malicious users? Oh, cool. Yeah. So this is one of the more interesting, or this is one of the very interesting um, areas of open research in FL, um, where you do try to understand like how malicious users interact with the system as a whole. Um, there's a lot of interesting papers out there. Um, I can somehow get those links. Maybe I can post them in that live stream chat. Yeah, we can share. Uh, links, you know, some sometimes during Q and A, um, I said that there are some things we will share. We could either add it to the site, or we can just compile them, put it on the the, uh, the YouTube recording. Yeah, that'd be super cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Are there any other questions for Emily? Okay, great. I don't see any other questions. And thank you so much, Emily, for joining us today. Um, we hope to see you again in our future event. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Margaret, for having me. <laughs> All right. Oh, I have read about GAM based attacks. Do you think that is a. Here's another question. Sorry. Do you think that is a potent attack? So again, I'm uh, one of the engineers on the team, but some of the researchers could probably give a better um, idea into this. Um, that is something interesting to think about, like a GAND-based attack in a federated um, setting. But again, for federated learning, there's the idea would be to have thousands and thousands of clients that you would do this training over. Um, so you'd have to infect such a large portion of clients that would be participating in this federated computation. Um, it is an interesting thing to think about. Uh, I can point you at some of the papers and the research that's gone into that. Great, sounds great. Okay, so if there are no more questions or you know, we can perhaps figure out a way to connect everyone with the speaker so that you know, if people have more questions they can ask. And uh, um, thanks again for Emily and uh, bye. Yeah, good to see you. <laughs>